But here's my question to you as we start this sermon. Have you ever asked, or have you ever been asked, what were you thinking? I, what, what were you thinking? You know, the question almost as always follows up some type of terrible decision that we've made on our part, or someone else is making on their part. Like, for instance, you, you exit the car without actually putting the car in park. Anybody ever done that? It, it, it's, yeah, it's not good. It's not good at all. Or you try to jump the creek on your bicycle. You know, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? Or you're up late at night because you can't sleep and you're watching TV and you see this gadget and you decide you are going to buy this gadget because this gadget slices, it dices, it gives you free internet and cable, and it makes money on the side. And so you buy this gadget at the high price of $49 for six payments of $49 a piece. And you get this special gadget. What were you thinking? There, there is something about the way in which we think that directly uh, results in the way in which we act. It has a direct bearing. Our thinking directly bears on our actions. We're in 1 Peter chapter 1, if you want to turn there. 1 Peter chapter 1. The very first verse of our text this morning, the very first half of that verse starts off like this. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. See, last week, Peter reminded us of our identity. Our identity in Christ, our identity in the Lord. He reminded us of all the things that God has provided for us. And this week, He begins to challenge us. He begins to challenge us to evaluate our thinking so that it will transform our actions. The truth is we are exiles in this world. We are foreigners here. We are strangers here. This is not our home. We're just passing through. We're just visiting. And so Peter challenges us to get your thinking right. To get your thinking ready. In fact, Paul does the same thing in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you is good and pleasing and perfect. Which is good and pleasing and perfect. We need to transform the way in which we think. In his book, The Next Story, Tim Calais writes, in 2006, American Online made an epic misjudgment as part of a research project, the company made available to the public a massive amount of data called from the search histories of 650,000 users over a three-month period. This totaled some 21 million searches. Now before AOL released the data, they changed all the users' names into anonymous user numbers. But it didn't take long before those numbers were linked to a real person. AOL realized its mistake and withdrew the data, but the search histories had already been copied and uploaded elsewhere on the internet. Tim offers the following summary based on AOL's mistake. It was possible to reconstruct a person's life at least in part from what they searched for over a period of time. What is remarkable about these searches is the way people transition seamlessly from the normal and the mundane to the outrageous and the perverse. One user went from searching for preteen pornography to searching for games appropriate for a youth a church youth group. Others spurned by lovers sought out ways to exact revenge, while others grappled with cheating on their spouses. Our searches are a penetrating window into our heart, he says. And he concludes with some very challenging questions. What does your data, data trail say about you? Would you be willing for your spouse to see it? Would you be willing for your parents to see it? Would you be willing for your pastor to see it? I didn't think he really went far enough because I think he really ought to add, would you be willing for God Almighty to see it? Because the truth is, He does see it. He 
He does know. He does know where your mind is and what you're thinking about, what you're looking into, where your desires are leading you. So what would your internet searches say about your thinking? See, God has called us, all of us, as Christians to a new identity, which requires us to change the way we think. And that change of thinking really must lead to a change of behavior. Attitudes should always lead to proper actions. Proper attitudes, proper actions. Today, I want us to look at our actions because that is the one of the most certain ways to reveal the attitudes of our heart. Our actions display what our heart, what our mind, and what our attitudes proclaim. What they are, where they are, and how they are being used or not being used for the Lord. A California driver's license examiner told about a teenager who had just driven an almost perfect exam. He made his only mistake, said the examiner, when he stopped to let me out of the car. After breathing a sigh of relief, the boy exclaimed, I'm sure glad I don't have to drive like this all the time. I don't know if he passed the test or not. But it began, it got me wondering how many people who claim to be Christians live it out for an hour or two on a Sunday morning, talk and act like they truly belong to the Lord Almighty, but when they leave for the other 166 hours in the week, there is really very little in their lives to distinguish them from the unbelieving world around them. It is almost like when they walk out of the doors of the church building on Sunday morning, they think to themselves, I'm sure glad I don't have to act like that all the time. That's what I want to look at this morning, our actions. See, God is looking for us to be transformed. Christianity is not a spectator sport. It is not a part-time calling. It is a call to action. So how does God want us to live? That's what I want us to look at this morning. So if you have your Bible, turn with me, 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to be in verse 13 to start off with. I already read half of the verse. I'm going to read to you the entire verse. It says, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the grace of salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. Peter is looking at our lives and he's reminding us of what we need to look forward to and he essentially is telling us, hey, you need to live your lives expectantly. You need to live your lives expectantly. You need to be ready for action. You need to be exercising self-control. You need to go all in with your hope because you know Jesus is going to return. Jesus is going to return. You need to live your life expecting that Jesus might return today. That's really what Peter is reminding us. Live your life in such a way that there's an urgency about it because Jesus might return today. What would you change? Or what would you do differently if you knew Jesus was returning tonight? Tonight He would come. Would you urgently share Jesus with someone you know? Would you make amends with someone who's offended you or someone you've offended? Would you let someone know that you love them? What would you do? Peter's challenging us. Keep your minds focused, your desires under control, and your hope properly focused because today may be the day. Live with urgency in the Lord. Expect His return. Know that He is coming. Is that how we as Christians are living? With this expectancy and urgency that Christ may come today. Eric Reed shares this story. He says, following an Easter service in 2003, a woman approached a pastor I know and asked, so what happened with Jesus after the resurrection? Well, He ascended into heaven and He's still alive, the pastor said. I know He was resurrected, but He's alive, she said. Yes, He's alive. Alive, alive? Why didn't you tell me? And for the next two weeks, she telephoned everyone she knew and exclaimed, Jesus is alive. Did you know He's alive? Let me ask you a question. Are you excited and exclaiming to the world 
that Jesus is alive through a life that is transformed and through a life of action? Are we proclaiming to the world that Jesus is coming again and our life confirms that? And our urgency proclaims that? In Colossians 3, verses 1-3, through it says this, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. When Christ sits in the place, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. Last week, did you live as if Jesus may return at any moment, at any day? By the way, you might be thinking, well, Jesus might not return for a long time. Well, that may be true, but you might go and face Him pretty doggone quickly. Because that, we have no idea. Neither one do we have any idea when they will come or not. We need to live expectantly before it is too late. We need to live expectantly. Peter goes on, verses 14 through 16. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. <coughs> For the Scripture says, you must be holy because I am holy. Peter starts off by saying you need to keep your eyes on the realization that Jesus may return at any moment. And then he transitions and he says, so you should be living expectantly, but you also should be living reflectively. You should be living reflectively. In fact, this last verse that I just read to you, verse 16, it astounds me. Be holy because God is holy. Peter seems to be calling for the impossible in our lives. To live a life that is reflective and representative of God. That's what He's calling for you and me to do. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, in the Christian Standard Bible, says there is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you, and there is no rock like our God. Reflecting the holiness of God seems completely out of reach. We feel overwhelmed at the thought. But Jesus came, and He lived the perfect holy life so that we could be freed from our sin. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul tells us, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins, so that we could be, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. You and I can never be perfect, but we can live holy lives by living for God, by following in the footsteps of Jesus by reflecting the very attributes and the very characteristics of our Lord and Savior. God is expecting you and me to represent Him. Which means you can't be living for yourselves and speaking for God. You can't place yourself first and then try to affirm and proclaim that Jesus sacrificed Himself for all humanity. That doesn't work. In fact, the very term Christian means little Christs. Or, it also could mean part of the Jesus party. But either way, that's exactly how we should be seen. You and I should be walking around in this world in such a way that when people look at us, they say, hey, that's a little Jesus. Hey, right there, they're part of the Jesus party. Look at them. Look at what they do. They serve people. They love people. They, they sacrifice for people. Just like their Savior did. Just like their Lord did. We should be reflective of God. In this world of darkness, we should be a shining light that shows them what God looks like, what Jesus looks like. <coughs> but Peter goes on. You should live expectantly. You should live reflectively. But he goes on, verses 17 through 21. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of Him during your time here as temporary residents. For you know the God you, uh, you know the God who paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it is it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, 
the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose Him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, He has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God. And you have placed your faith and hope in God because He raised Christ from the dead and gave Him great glory. Paul, or excuse me, Peter tells us you need to live courageously. You need to live courageously. After reminding us of all that God has done in this passage, all that God has provided for us through His Son Jesus, Peter calls us to trust God, to place our faith and hope in God. Let me ask you a question. If God is willing to send His Son and allow Him to be sacrificed for our sin, then surely we can live a courageous life of trust in God, right? I mean, if God would do all that for us, then surely we can live courageously for Him, trusting that He can always provide. Some of my favorite verses, Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. So God works everything for our good. A few verses later it says, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? The truth is, we should have courageous trust. But that doesn't seem to be the mark of the Christian. And it doesn't seem to be the mark of many churches. And why not? Because we're not keeping in view what God has done for us, what God has given for us, what God has provided for us, and what God has filled us with. We aren't living in complete trust because for some reason we don't trust God completely. In fact, to be a Christian should mean to trust God completely. Is it rational to trust God even when we do not fully understand what He is doing? One of the most illuminating answers was put forward by an Oxford philosopher, Basil Mitchell, in his celebrated parable of the resistance leader. And this is the parable. Imagine you are in German-occupied France during World War II, and you want to join the resistance movement against the Nazis. One evening in the local bar, a stranger comes up to you and introduces himself as the leader of the local partisans. He spends the evening with you, explaining the general requirements of your duties, giving you a chance to assess his trustworthiness, and offering you a chance (coughs) to go no further. But his warning is stern. If you join, your life will be at risk. This will be the only face-to-face meeting you will have. After this, you will receive orders and you will have to follow them without question, often completely in the dark as to the whys and the wherefores of the operations, and always with the terrifying fear that your trust may be betrayed. Is such trust reasonable? Sometimes what the resistance leader is doing is obvious. He is helping members of the resistance. Thank heavens, he is on our side, you say. Sometimes it is not obvious. He is in a Gestapo uniform arresting partisans and unknown to you, releasing them out of sight to help them escape the Nazis. But always you must trust and follow the orders without question, despite all appearances, no matter what happens. The resistant leader, resistance leader knows best, you say. Only after the war will the secrets be open, the codes revealed, the true comrades vindicated, the traitors exposed, and sense made of the expectations. Os Guinness adds this to that parable. He says, The parable of the resistance leader is an apt picture of the dilemma of faith in a fallen world. Evil is not a problem because God is too small, as though He's just doing His best. Evil is a problem because God is so great that we cannot be expected to know what He is doing. 
Essentially, what they're reminding us of is that God is so great that we are never going to understand the complexity of His plan. But we are supposed to just essentially courageously obey Him, even when we don't understand, even when we can't see why, even when we don't know where we're going. We still obey God. Because God is God. And we are not. That's the call. Live courageously. Hebrews 6, verses 18 and 19. So God has given both His promise and His oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to Him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. We have this hope in God and we should be able to live without fear because God is our Father and God is great. And then there's one last thing I think we should learn here from this text and it's found in verse 22. And it says this, You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now, you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. God has called us to love expectantly, or live expectantly, live reflectively, live courageously, and now we are called to live affectionately, to express our love openly for each other. You know, that can be extremely hard for some of us. But that's the call. God's love saved you. Now you are called to demonstrate that love to others. In 1 Corinthians 13, we know that is the chapter of love. We normally start in verse 4. But if you start in verse 1, I want you to listen to what it says. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others... I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love of others is not optional. It is not an option. You don't get to choose, well, I'm going to love others or not love others. You don't even really get to choose if I'm going to love some others or not all others. It's all or nothing. Putting their best interest above your own is required. Sacrificing for them is required. In fact, John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus says, So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. The truth is we often resist love. Because love is risky business. We might not get it returned to us if we give it. We might get hurt if we give it. It might cost us dearly if we give it. It may be painful if we give it. But isn't that exactly what Jesus endured for love? Isn't that exactly what Jesus went through because He loved me and you? C.S. Lewis talks about love like this. To love it all is to be vulnerable Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to be sure of keeping your heart intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safely in the casket of your selfishness. And in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will not change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, and irredeemable. The only place outside of heaven where you can be safe, perfectly safe from the dangers of love is hell. We've got to love people, and I know it's dangerous, but we have got to love people. 
people. It means being vulnerable and we don't like to do it, but we have got to love people because we have been loved. See, last week Peter reminded us of who we are in the Lord, but now he is calling us to live out who we should be in this world. So let me just ask you, are you living with expectancy? Are, are you expecting Jesus to return today? Is that how you're living with this urgency of the message? Are you living each day reflecting the holiness of God? Striving to, to show people what God looks like by the way you live? Are you living with this courageous trust that no matter what you're going through or where you're going, God has got it. He's got it. He's got it taken care of. Are you living affectionately, even if it costs you? Even if it is painful to you? Are you living affectionately? See, God is calling us to action. And as a Christian, we've said we've accepted the call, but the question is, have we really accepted the call? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to You this morning. I come to You this morning and I recognize that sometimes this, this expectancy and this reflectivity and this courageous trust and, and this affectionate uh, life is, is not what I display. It's not what I give to others. In fact, so often I get caught up in my own selfishness that I try to barricade myself from those that might hurt me, from things that might cause me pain. But that, that's not the way You've called me to live. You called me to put myself out there, to be urgent with the message, to show people what, what you look like through a life that's lived for you. Not perfectly, but, but striving every day to get closer and closer to what, what Jesus displayed while He was here. You called me to step out into places that I can't possibly understand the plan, but to be courageous and trust you. And you called me to love people who don't deserve love, but that you want me to love. By the way, I didn't deserve it either. Lord, I pray for each of us here. I pray that we won't just remember who we are in You, but we'll display to the world who we are in You. It's great to be reminded of who we are, but it better lead to an action. It better lead to transformation. It needs to be proclaiming to the world who You are. So Lord, as we listen to Your Word and let it penetrate our hearts, I pray that we will make some changes in our lives, changes that start even today. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.